Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm chatting with Rudy Frank from Seabridge Gold. In this interview, we get into the gold market of which Rudy's got some pretty strong opinions for a guy who's been doing it for 25 years with one of the most successful stocks that's out there in the gold space and listed on the NYSE. So he's not just some junior gold CEO. He's a guy who's coming here with some real credibility. He also tells us why he says that gold companies are arguably the worst capital allocators in the world. And no, he's not talking about junior miners. He's talking about the big guys. You're going to want to hear this. And we talk Seabridge and their KSM project, which from proven and probable all the way down to inferred has around 200 million ounces of gold, over 60 million pounds of copper and around a billion ounces of silver, not to mention a whole boatload of molybdenum. Guys, I think this is the most exciting project in all of mining. Should it get to production? It wouldn't shock me if Seabridge ended up becoming one of the major mining companies in the world. There are negotiations right now to do a JV with who I assume are the largest mining companies in the world. And they're all looking at throwing major dollars at this project. So guys, if you're following the gold space closely and you're looking for names to put on your watch list, if you're not following this story, I don't know what you're doing. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Rudy, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Good to see you guys again. So gold uh, has had a pretty good year since the last time we spoke. We met for the first time at the Rick Rule conference in Boca Raton last July. Since then, gold's been on a bit of a tear. Rudy, you're a guy, you've been in the space for a long time. Big believer in gold, I assume, with uh, all the success that you've had on moving your projects forward. What's your outlook on gold here? What's the story? What does Rudy Frank think about when he thinks about the the gold story right now? Well, we remain extremely bullish and constructive on gold. In fact, we published quite a bit about the gold market on our website. We just had a new publication that came out just a week ago uh, on the gold market and why we think it's going a lot higher. I mean, if you look at the gold market today, uh, obviously gold is at all time highs in just about every currencies and just off of it in the US dollar. But I think when you look at the makeup of the gold market now, it's quite interesting and different from many times in the past. You have the East that continues to buy all the gold that they can, regardless of price. And you have the Western investors that have not yet shown up to the party, and they will. And when they do, that's when we're going to see, I think, the big move in gold equities. If you look at gold mining stocks today relative to the gold price, gold mining stocks are as cheap as they've ever been relative to gold in my 40 years in the business. That's going to change, I think, when the Western investor comes back to the space. They're the ones that buy mining stocks. And I think that's where we get a two to three X move in gold mining equities as the Western investor comes back to the space. Now, this morning I was watching a presentation that you gave at the Rick Rule conference that I just previously spoke of. I didn't get a chance to watch it live at the time. Uh, I just watched it this morning and I thought that that's a great watch for anybody who is interested in sort of the overall gold theme, that presentation you gave uh, there. But one of the things that you talked about at it is how the gold industry are probably the worst allocators of capital out there. What did you mean by that? Well, I think it, it boils down to equity dilution and per share metrics. If, if you look at the uh, the mining space, uh, share after share after share is issued by not just the exploration and development stage companies, but the majors. And they're not offsetting that dilution with value. You know, we have one chart on our uh, corporate presentation that looks at our relative share price compared to the gold price and other leading gold mining companies over the long haul. So since we started the company, which is now 25 years ago, our share price is up over 8,000%. The gold price is up about 800%. So we've outperformed the gold price by about 10 to one, great. People buy gold stocks with the expectation that gold is up 10%. Gold mining share on buying should be up by more than 10% because of embedded operating leverage. If you look at our industry, however, all of the major gold companies over the long haul have underperformed the gold price by a big way. Example, I'm going to pick on Barrick today because I think they've probably been the worst in terms of equity dilution. Uh, you know, over the same time period, over this 25 year time period, gold is up 800 percent. Their share price is up 30 percent. OK, and if you look at as a company uh, since 2007, since the financial crisis, they've more than doubled their share count. OK, so they've issued shares, yet their production is down from 8 million ounces to 4 million ounces. The reserves are down from 125 million ounces to 75 million ounces. 
So when you tie all that back to per share metrics, they've destroyed shareholder value by, by decreasing ounces of reserves per common share and production. And it's no wonder their share price has performed you know, the way it has relative to the gold price. And it's 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 frustrating as a junior mining investor and somebody who uh, makes my living in the space because I believe that in order for us to see those capital flows start to come into those, you know, second tier and more junior names, we need the major names to perform. We need to see the Agnico Eagles and the Barracks and the Newmonts really perform so that people can get excited and start to go down the risk curve. And uh, like we've seen some okay returns. Like I know, I know Agnico Eagles done a good job, but the, the the returns we're seeing relative to the move in gold, it 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 still feels like there's a lot of alpha to be had uh, in in these major names. And I know that we're picking on Barrick here, but like 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 even e, e, even with the the macro that you just described for Barrick, you'd still think that there'd be more capital flowing in at this point, wouldn't you? And it's not. I think a lot of the big companies shot themselves in the foot in terms of misallocation of capital over the long haul. And shareholders and the investors have a long memory to that. But look, I, I do believe that when the Western investor comes back and wants exposure to gold, and right now they probably have the lowest exposure to gold in the 40 years I've been in the business on a relative basis to other assets they invest in. But when the Western investor does come back into gold, they will be looking at the majors first. That's where the that's where they will invest in because those are the better name better known names, the ones the big bank firms cover, and dollars will flow into those first and they'll get the move first. But then you'll start to see those dollars flow down the food chain to development stage companies and exploration stage companies that have good projects. And when you look at these big moves that I think we're about to start to see here in the not too distant future, yeah, gold stocks, the seniors will move okay initially, but the big performance will be in companies like Seabridge, uh, like Skeena, like uh, Nova Gold, that actually have delivered on the idea of uh, capital efficiency over the long haul. So I know you're a hockey fan. Last time we spoke, you talked about the Colorado Avalanche. And um, I just thinking of this anecdote uh, from when I was younger, um, where I remember our hockey coach once came in and he was frustrated with us as a team. And he wrote three words down on a whiteboard that was sort of the message that, that that he wanted us to receive. And it was shoot the puck. And he was tired of seeing us pass it around and waste time and just get the sh shoot, shoot the puck on goal. And um, I'm curious here for you as an organization over the last couple of decades, what's, what's been that central theme when, if, if, if you were to go to your staff with your, you know, your CFO, your operations people and um, your corporate development people, and you just have one theme that you've been trying to drill in their heads for the last uh, 25 years since you guys first went public. What's that theme? What are you putting on that whiteboard for them? Well, that's easy. It's grow ounces in the ground of gold faster than shares outstanding. The more gold that we can provide on a per share basis to our shareholders, the better our share price should do as the gold price goes higher. And if you look at our 25 year track record, that's what we've done. I mean, today we have uh, over two ounces of gold resources per common share in the ground. Nobody comes close to us. And then on top of that, we have a lot of copper, a lot of silver, and a lot of molybdenum as well. So it's the idea of offsetting equity dilution with real value defined as growing ounces on a per share basis. A lot's a little bit of an understatement too. Uh, what I find so fascinating about you guys is from... Proven and probable all the way down to inferred. Uh, I'm, I'm just running these numbers off the top of my head. You guys are close to 200 million ounces of gold. That's not to mention over 20 billion, uh, over 50 billion pounds of copper, um, a, a billion ounces of uh, silver, and I'm not even mentioning the molybdenum. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So in all resource categories, and I know we're not supposed to combine inferred with measured and indicated, but if you do, we have 183 million ounces of gold. We have 59 billion pounds of copper. We have 900 million ounces of silver, and we've got over a billion pounds of molybdenum. And we only have 90 million shares outstanding. And by the way, some companies are public today and like pretty excited because they have 1 million ounces of measured, indicated, or inferred. You guys are have 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 a number, you know, over a hundred x that. It's 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 to me, it's insanity. I think that you guys are the most interesting story 
in 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 the gold space out there. Uh, so let's talk about how you guys move it move it forward. Uh, you guys were talking at the Rick Rule conference about how you guys needed to get this designation that uh, the BC government calls uh, substantially started. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that means, but then shortly after the conference, you guys announced that you got that designation. You were saying at the time it was important to get that designation because then you would be able to go out and seek some joint venture partners. First off, maybe walk us through what that designation means. And secondly, if you can give us any insights at all into how those joint venture conversations are going. Sure. Well, without violating any uh, confidentiality agreements I have in place, of course. Yeah. So, um, you know, KSM, obviously it's big. It's very robust from an economic perspective. It has the support of the Indigenous people, but what really separates KSM from other large projects around the world is we're approved from the environmental approval process. We have construction permits in hand. We received most of those initial permits back in 2014. Uh, based on timelines within the BC government, they were set to expire in 2026. Uh, there's a mechanism in British Columbia known as substantially started that if we got that designation, it means the permits we have don't expire in July of 2026. They're good for the life of the project. So we went out in 2021, we raised about a half a billion dollars Canadian specifically to do this work on the ground. We've built roads, we've built camps, we've built fish compensation areas, we've built bridges, and we've tied into the power grid with BC Hydro that gives us access to cheap hydro power. After doing that work and filing the, the application with the government, the government saw fit to give us this designation uh, this past July. So we now have a project where all the authorizations we have don't expire in July of 2026. They're good for the life of the project, which in our case goes on for multi-generations. So you guys also got a license uh, to build a 23 kilometer uh, tunnel connecting the east and west sides of your projects. Um, can you maybe uh, give us a little bit of a uh, color, help us understand sort of what that means. Is, 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 is that to, so you guys can drill deeper? What's, what's, what's the no, tunnel for? No, it's actually for? to connect us. So a big, big component of the infrastructure at KSM would be connecting the five deposits that we have on one side of the project to where we have our mill permitted and our tailing facility permitted. And that's separated by about 22 kilometers. Uh, part of that, that tunnel route does go through third party claims. Uh, so we need to get certain authorizations from the government to do the work on those claims, even though they weren't ours, which now involves the license of occupation. Uh, originally, we got a 10-year license of occupation. The government now just gave us another 20 years on top of that. We have a construction permit, perm permit M245, that gives us the right to construct the portals for those tunnels and the first 100 meters of uh, tunnel length. We've now applied for an amendment for the full length of the tunnels under that permit. And probably most important, that we have a mineral reserve. A mineral reserve ensures that nobody else can interfere with our tunnel. And that's an important aspect of this project. So that's why uh, we worked hard not only to get these rights initially, but also to ensure that our rights are still in good standing and allow us to move forward with the project. So Rudy, you guys have such a gigantic project uh, that it almost make, doesn't make sense that you guys are like, like you guys still have a handful of other projects you guys are exploring, which... I'm sure based on your history are all great projects, but what's, what's the idea behind doing ex exploration outside of this region or this district uh, when you guys have like a hundred year mine life uh, already on your hands? Well, right now we don't have any revenues other than if we choose to sell non-core assets to generate cash, we're issuing shares to raise capital for our activities. So we want to make sure that if we do issue shares to raise capital, that we have other ways of adding ounces to continue to grow ounces per share. So we take advantage of down markets. We did that in the early years. We bought KSM at the bottom of the gold and copper market in 2001. Uh, and then in 2015, when valuations got decimated again, we went out and acquired three new projects. And we're now starting to see the, uh, you know, the benefits of those three acquisitions. Just recently, we announced some really encouraging drill results at our ISCA property, the, the North SNP zone where we intersected from surface, you know, upwards of 500 meters of continuous mineralization of, uh, you know, half a gram or better gold with good copper values. So it's these uh, these other projects we have in the portfolio that will provide future growth in terms of ounces per share. But, but don't get me wrong, the most important aspect of the company now is KSM. We've made it very clear that this is a project well beyond our capabilities to build and operate. 
So we've been talking about bringing in a uh, joint venture partner, i.e. one of the leading gold or copper companies on the planet to, con to enter into a joint venture with us so we can get to a construction decision and make this project a reality in terms of gold, copper, and silver production. So something, when, when, when I was having conversations about some of the companies in the Golden Triangle with uh, other investors I know, some of them kind of, you know, portfolio managers, astute sort of investors, a lot of them sort of scoff at the Golden Triangle when I bring it up. They say it's too remote. It's too challenging to take uh, pro uh, projects online. When you hear this, if you're in a meeting with portfolio managers or investors and they bring this up, how do you typically respond? Well, I would agree that when we bought this project in 2001 from Placer Dome, it was remote. It was logistically challenged. That's one of the reasons why Placer Dome sold it to us for pennies on the dollar. But if you look at what's happened since then in the region, we now have a major highway, Highway 37, that runs right past KSM. Along that highway, the government spent over $700 million extending the power grid, bringing cheap hydropower to the district. We've now contracted with BC Hydro 245 megawatts of power from this line. In fact, uh, as part of substantially started expenditures, they're now building our switching station. And we have uh, in the town of Stewart, we have a port facility that was there long term that that took off and uh, concentrate from the old Eskate Creek mine. That's now taking a uh, uh, concentrate from the Red Chris mine. And on top of that uh, port, they've actually built a brand new port. They're now waiting for a new uh, uh, tenant. So having access to ports, power and roads is the infrastructure you need to make a project like KSM work. So I would agree that, you know, historically that is the case in terms of logistics, but that's no longer the case by any shape of the world word now. And, 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 and you guys are under the, the, the Nishka tribes uh, jurisdiction, correct? Nishka and Taltan. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and, uh, we, and we have, we have, we have impact benefit in agreements in place with both of them. In fact, as we were doing the substantially started, uh, you know, activities, uh, they were entitled to certain contracts under the IBAs uh, for that construction work. Uh, you know, you, so you give one contract to the Niska Nation, the Teltan Nation was not happy. You give it to the Teltan Nation, the Niska Nation was not happy. So we actually uh, suggested to the Niska and the Teltan, why don't you form a strategic joint venture? We'll give you all the work and you share it amongst yourselves. So they formed the Treaty Creek Limited Partnership and if you look at the $500 million we've now spent on substantially started activities, more than half of that went to First Nations contractors. So, Okay, so Rudy, last question for you. If I am interested in the story, what am I looking out for over the next 12 months? Well, I think, uh, you know, getting a deal done. Uh, we've made it very clear that this is our prime objective. Uh, we are running a formal joint venture process. We brought in RBC Capital Markets a little over a year ago. We have six companies at the table we're engaged with in terms of joint venture discussions. What I will say is this substantially started designation is a game changer with respect to joint venture discussions. You can imagine that any big mining company looking at a project like KSM, knowing that in a short period of time, the permits could be uh, canceled or expire, that was a risk. By getting this designation, we've removed that risk now and dialogue that is now going on as a result of uh, removing that risk from the table. So that's that's clearly number one. Number two will be continued exploration activities. I mean, we have three earlier stage projects. We just announced our first uh, set of drill results from the ISCA property. We have more to come on that and probably more to drill next year as well. Well, Rudy, thanks very much for hopping on here. I th I, I'm, I'm not just saying that because you're in front of me. I do think that this is the most interesting uh, story uh, in in uh i don't know if we'd say uh junior mining but in 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 mining and gold in general uh just because it's just the sheer size of what we're looking at here is just so gigantic uh that i'm certainly rooting for you and uh as soon as you guys get that joint venture done and get into production and you guys become one of the largest gold names in the world hopefully you'll still find the time to come on and talk to us little guys uh because uh i love the story I, I guarantee I will. I never shy away from these type of opportunities and appreciate your interest in the story. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rudy. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Also, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks, everyone.